Um, today we have a lot of my students from international criminal law because the subject is one that is uh, ripped right from the course. Um, can you guys raise your hand so you can see who our students are? And then um, those of you who are uh, case alum, can you raise your hands? So it's nice also to have this opportunity for the students to get a chance to talk to the lawyers um, in the morning and to you know maybe start their networking early. Um, today we're going to be talking about is terrorism worth defining? And uh, this event is self-introducing, so um, hopefully you know who I am. There's a little bio about me, but I am Michael Scharf. I am uh, the director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center, and I, I have several other hats at the law school, but it basically means that I run the international program. And I've been there now for a decade. I'm actually a Cleveland native. I started my life in Shaker Heights, uh, went off to Duke undergrad in law school, clerked down on the 11th Circuit in Florida, worked five years at the U.S. Department of State. And while I was at the State Department, I was originally assigned to be the attorney advisor for counterterrorism affairs. And so this... Uh, subject is one that I played a, a somewhat of a role in shaping in the early years. In fact, I gave one of the first speeches of the United States government as a delegate to the United Nations about why we do not need an international convention that generically defines terrorism. And it'll be interesting to see after the end of this speech whether we've gone full circle on that. Um, at Case Western, one of the things I do is direct the War Crimes Research Office. And some of my students that are here are taking the War Crimes Research Lab. What we do is we prepare memos at the request of international tribunals. One of those tribunals is the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, which you're going to be hearing about a lot today. Um, and we've been doing a lot of the work behind the scenes for that tribunal. We actually have our students act as if they are junior lawyers, backstopping the work that's going on at the tribunal. The senior lawyer at that tribunal is a case alum, uh, Chris Rossi, who is going to be honored next month with the Distinguished Young Alumni Award. And he left the law school, um, did some internships with some tribunals, worked originally at the Rwanda Tribunal, and is now the senior lawyer at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon in the Office of the Prosecutor. So the question about is terrorism worth defining really goes to the question of what is a terrorist and the old saying that one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. And that's because where you stand has a lot to do with, or where you sit has a lot to do with where you stand on this issue of terrorism. When you look at, at different types of uh, people who are struggling for freedom, and you say, well, is that a terrorist or is that a freedom fighter? It, it really depends on what side you are. For example, um, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan were, during the Reagan administration and, and the um, early years, they were our freedom fighters that we supported. You all have seen or heard about the movie Charlie Wilson's War. It was all about how we supported those freedom fighters. Well, those guys morphed into al-Qaeda. And, and now al-Qaeda are the terrorists. Um, I suppose if al-Qaeda had been fighting the Soviet Union during the Cold War, we'd still think of them as freedom fighters, even though they were doing everything that they've been doing against us. So a lot of this question has to do with where you stand and, and whose side these people are on. The international community, however, has been trying to come up with a definition of terrorism that captures the entire concept for 30 years. And it just has reached a impasse. And the current impasse is between most of the um, Western world and the Islamic world. And the Islamic world, and there's many countries, so they have a nice sized block, able to block uh, and prevent action at the UN on this issue, believe that there has to be a exception to the definition of terrorism for those people who are struggling legitimately against colonial powers. And for the most part, they're thinking about the Palestinians and their struggle against Israel. But that could also apply in other places. In the United Nations, because they could not come up with one accepted definition of terrorism, they went to Plan B. And Plan B was to start defining certain crimes that the whole world could agree were illegal, never justifiable under any circumstances. 
And the first one they took was hostage taking. It's just never allowed to take hostages, no matter what your motives are, what the context is. And so they went and entered into an international convention against hostage taking. And it has a responsibility for any country who finds a perpetrator who was engaged in hostage taking in their territory to either prosecute that perpetrator or to extradite them to another country. And this is called the odetere judicare, which is Latin for to prosecute or extradite. Now, the, the hostage taking convention was successful, and so they expanded it to the hijacking convention. We can all agree, can't we, that anybody who takes a civil aircraft and hijacks it is an international criminal. Now, they didn't ever use the word terrorism in these conventions because that was too much of a loaded term. They just said it was an international crime to commit hijacking. And then they said, well, okay, if we can agree on hostage taking and hijacking, how about airport and airplane sabotage? We just don't like it when people blow up our civil aircraft. So they created another convention. And they did this on a number of these issues where there was international consensus. And then they went from the type of crime to the type of victim, and they created a treaty that says that any time you attack an internationally protected person who is defined as a head of state or a diplomat, that that is an international crime. So now it's not just what you're doing, but it's also who you're targeting, but very narrow. And then finally, there was a convention on using explosives against civilians. And that's probably the broadest of these anti-terrorism conventions because uh, explosives are often the weapon of terrorists. But by listing these um, conventions that have been negotiated over the last 20 years in these general UN resolutions, the United Nations has basically carved out under customary international law an area of terrorism that the whole world has agreed on. And these resolutions also say that these acts are unjustifiable, they're criminal, there must be international cooperation, and there must be prosecution. And this has created the customary international law on at least a segment of terrorism. But the UN resolutions are also negotiated in the context of the Islamic countries and the Western powers struggle. And so they include a savings clause that says, the resolution preserves the right of persons to struggle legitimately for self-determination. It doesn't define what that means. But if you look at the word struggle legitimately, that's been interpreted to say you can use acts of terrorism that are not covered by these international conventions when you are struggling for self-determination. And that means that there's a whole big area that aren't covered by these conventions. For example, assassinations of businessmen, engineers, journalists, educators, and lawyers are not included, while similar attacks against diplomats and public officials are covered by the treaties. Attacks or sabotage by means other than explosives against passenger trains or buses or against a water supply or an electric power plant are not dealt with in the conventions, while similar attacks against airplanes or ocean liners would be covered by these treaties. Moreover, most forms of cyber terrorism are not covered by the treaties, and acts of psychological terror that do not involve physical injury are not at all covered. So even though placing fake bombs in public places or sending fake anthrax through the mails can be every bit as much as traumatizing to a population as an actual attack. And by traumatizing, I mean, I mean it can shut down public buildings and it can bring a country to a standstill when they're afraid of a fake terrorist attack based on threats. Those are not covered by the conventions. Now, I'm going to tell you now a little bit about the Special Tribunal for Lebanon because it has played an unexpected and huge role in suddenly propelling a new definition of terrorism that might solve this logjam that has existed at the United Nations for the last three decades. The Special Tribunal for Lebanon was established in 2007 by the UN Security Council to prosecute those responsible for the 2005 bombings that killed the former Prime Minister of Lebanon, Rafiq Harari, and 22 other senior officials. This tribunal, uh, this is 
photo of the bombing. It was awful. It, it, in fact, was such a huge bombing attack in Lebanon that it was felt as earthquake tremors as far away as 500 miles. So this special tribunal, which you're now looking at, the slide for, um, is located in the Netherlands, in The Hague, where all, many of the other tribunals are located. I mentioned our alumni, Chris Rossi, has um, risen to the level of senior uh, legal advisor to the prosecutors, and a number of our law students from CASE have interned there or will be interning there over the summer. Um, so this is a photo of it. It's in the old FBI building in the Netherlands. On January 17, 2011, the tribunal's prosecutor, Danielle Bellamar from Canada, submitted a sealed indictment for the pretrial judges to confirm. The pretrial judge, in turn, requested that the appeals chamber resolve 15 questions related to the substantive criminal law to be applied by the Special Tribunal for Lebanon and the modes of criminal responsibility to be applied by the tribunal, and also whether the tribunal should charge crimes cumulatively or in the alternative. What's interesting is that I found out more recently that this was not the idea of the pretrial judge, but rather the president of the tribunal, who also runs the appeals chamber, who is an expert at terrorism, has written a lot on the subject over the years, said to the pretrial judge, I want you to make a request of us so that we can issue an opinion. And the pretrial judge just did that. Now, in the US, you wouldn't have such a pretrial question. That, that's not the way we do things. But in many courts around the world, you can ask for advisory opinions by the appeals court on the law to clarify it before you get launched into it. And it probably makes sense here because rather than waiting to an appeal at the end of the day, this way the prosecutor would know what the elements of the crimes are that they need to prove from the beginning. So the appeals chamber uh, got this on January 17th, and about three weeks later they had a briefing on it, and they had oral arguments. And then on February 16th, so in less than one month, they issued a 300-page opinion. The timing of that would suggest that the opinion was pre-drafted. And given that we now also know that the judge had requested the request for the opinion, we know that that's in fact what happened. As an aside, our law school is very proud that we are one of the journals that were cited in this judicial opinion. Um, it's always exciting when your law review is cited by the U.S. Supreme Court or a federal appellate court. But when you're cited in the landmark opinion on one of the most important issues in the world in this day by an international tribunal, and that's really something. And so our Journal of International Law's terrorism issue was cited in this opinion. The unanimous ruling of the five appeals chamber judges was signed by the president of the tribunal who I mentioned, and this is him, uh, Judge Antonio Cassese, who held the title Judge Rapporteur of the Special Tribunal's Appeals Chamber. Now, I, I should tell you this. Just this weekend, Judge Cassese passed away of cancer. He'd been battling it for a while, and in a way, his rush to get this opinion done early was his race against cancer. I, I want to tell you some more about this unusual and extraordinary jurist. Judge Cassese was formerly a professor of international law at the University of Florence, and he served as the president of the Yugoslavia Tribunal during the early years of that court. It's interesting because he was never a trial judge. He never was a prosecutor or a defense counsel. He came to this area as a professor. And I think part of his approach to the law is one that is uniquely scholarly, but not at all grounded in the realities of prosecuting cases. And you'll see that in a few minutes. While he was at the Yugoslavia Tribunal, however, he wrote some of the most important opinions in international law ever penned by a jurist. For example, during his tenure as president of the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the tribunal's appeals chamber held for the first time in history that individual criminal responsibility applied not just during international armed conflict, which the U.S. and the International Committee of the Red Cross and most of the countries in the world thought was the limits of international criminal responsibility, but according to the Yugoslavia Tribunal's opinion, it also applied in internal armed conflicts. That opened the door for the creation of the Rwanda Tribunal 
and for the Cambodia Tribunal to be applying the laws of war and internal armed conflict, as well as the special court for Sierra Leone. All of this new jurisprudence about individual criminal responsibility in internal armed conflict, which we take for granted today, 15 years ago, the scholars and experts of the world thought that would have been impossible. Judge Cassese and his tribunal in Yugoslavia also developed the novel concept of joint criminal enterprise liability, which has since been applied by the International Tribunal for Rwanda, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Cambodia Tribunal, and in this same opinion by the Lebanon Tribunal. Joint criminal enterprise liability is very controversial in international law. It's almost like conspiracy theory. What it's most like in the United States is the felony murder rule. What it says, especially under what's known as JCE3, which is the third type of joint criminal enterprise liability, is that if you willingly join an international criminal activity, you know, you get together with some other people to do something bad, anything that anybody does as part of that enterprise, whether it's in the plan or outside of the plan, you can be held responsible for, as long as it's reasonably foreseeable. And for those of you who remember tort law, reasonable foreseeability under the Paul's graph standard can be quite a stretch. So in American felony murder rule, for example, you have somebody who agrees to be the getaway driver or the person who just uh, you know, looks at a store to see um, what its security is like. And then during the actual robbery, they're not involved, but something goes wrong, someone dies, and then they can be held responsible, not as an accomplice to murder, but actually as a co-perpetrator for the murder. And so joint criminal enterprise liability, which has been applied to these international trials, has been the favorite tool of the prosecution because it is so much easier to convict people on this theory than it is on grounds that they actually committed the crime or ordered the crime or on even command responsibility. But it's been very controversial. The defense bar calls JCE, they think that the initials actually stand for just convict everyone, not joint criminal enterprise. And, and there have been critiques that it is sort of a, a form of um, guilt by association. And this is a struggle that's going on. But this struggle is due to Judge Cassese because he is a pioneer. He's a legal entrepreneur. While he is a judge, he is creating new law and it is applying retroactively as well as prospectively, which for those of you who work in the criminal law field may feel a little squeamish about. Let's now talk about what he's done in his opportunity to define terrorism and break the logjam that has existed for so long. Although the Special Tribunal for Lebanon statute stipulates that the court is to apply the crime of terrorism as defined by Lebanese law, not international law, and although Lebanese law is very clear in its definition of terrorism, the appeals chamber held that the special tribunal was authorized to construe Lebanese law defining terrorism with the assistance of international customary law, which means that he decided he wanted to look at whether there was, in fact, a definition of terrorism in customary international law and announce its existence, define it, and try to get the world to apply it, even though the statute that he was acting under told him that he wasn't supposed to do that. This is a departure from the traditional approach of treaty interpretation, which is reflected in Article 32 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which is known as the Treaties on Treaties. It's the treaty that has been promulgated to define how one interprets other treaties. That article says that a tribunal should apply, quote, the ordinary meaning of the terms of, of a statute or a treaty unless the text is found to be either ambiguous or obscure or would lead to an interpretation which is manifestly absurd or unreasonable. And in international law, whatever you feel about interpreting your own domestic law or your own constitutions, when you talk about international law, most experts are very cautious. They don't want international judges to be expansioning, expansionists, um, expanding the definitions. They want to keep things kind of bot bottled up where the negotiating record meant them to be. Since the statute of the special tribunal clearly stated that the court was to apply the Lebanese domestic law on terrorism, under the traditional approach of the Vienna Convention, resort to supplementary means of interpretation, including looking outside at international law's definition of terrorism, would be inappropriate in this case for three reasons. One, 
there really is no inconsistency or gap in the applicable Lebanese law. It was quite, quite clear. Secondly, this is not a case where the domestic law at issue is implementing a treaty, in which case you would look to see what the international practice was of the treaty. And thirdly, this is not a case in which the international law is being invoked to protect an individual's rights, but rather it is widening the criminal liability of the individual. So in diverging from the traditional approach, Judge Cassese in the appeals chamber stated Interestingly, quote, the old maxim in clearest non-fit interpretation, which is Latin for when the text is clear, there is no need for interpretation. He says, quote, is in truth fallacious. And he explains that, quote, it overlooks the spectrum of meanings that words, and especially a collection of words, may have and uh, misses the truth that context can determine meaning. Hmm. So instead of applying the old approach, what he is doing is applying a semiotic approach to interpretation. Who here has ever heard of the word semiotics before? Raise your hand. All right, so the students have, because we talked about it in class. Some of, the, some of the practitioners have heard it as well. Well, has anybody ever read any of the books by Umberto Eco, like uh, The Name of the Rose, or seen that old movie with Sean Connery? Raise your hand if you have. Okay. Umberto Eco was a famous semiotician. And he wrote the book, The Name of the Rose, to try to expose the general population to how a semiotics approach would apply. In that case, it was um, a case of a murder investigation done by a priest uh, in the, I think, um, uh, Middle Ages, basically. And the question was, do you use religious tools or do you use semiotics to try to interpret the findings? And, and when you read the book, you actually become an expert at semiotics. Well, semiotics begins with the assumption that terms such as terrorism are not historic artifacts whose meaning remains static over time, but rather the meaning of such terms changes along with the interpretive community or communities. As the Special Tribunal for Lebanon Appeals Chamber wrote in its opinion, this interpretive approach, quote, recognizes the reality that society alters over time and interpretation of a law may evolve to keep pace. Well, there have been semioticians in famous uh, jurists in the United States, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said that the law is a living creature and the Constitution is living, breathing, and always growing, was actually a semiotician. But this is not generally the approach that is applied in international law, and it is not the approach that the Americans, even those who believe in interpreting our own constitution that way, generally like to see uh, in international law. Now, the appeals chamber thus held that it was appropriate to read the Lebanese law in the context of international obligations undertaken by Lebanon, which in the absence of very clear language, it is presumed any legislation complies. This interpretive approach opened the door for the tribunal to not just look at the Lebanese law, but to look at international law and the definition of terrorism. And to that end, the tribunal held, quote, although it is held by many scholars and other legal experts that no widely accepted definition of terrorism has evolved in the world society because of the marked difference of views on some issues, Closer scrutiny reveals that, in fact, such a definition has gradually emerged. Now, that's not actually at all true. Almost everybody recognizes that there is a wide gap between the two sides on coming up with a general definition of terrorism and that the international community is not there yet. But based on its review of state practice and indicators of opinio juris, which is a sense of binding legal obligation, Judge Cassese in the appeals chamber declared that customary international law has now defined terrorism. And according to the judge, this is the international definition of terrorism. It has three key elements. One, the perpetration of a criminal act, such as murder, kidnapping, hostage-taking, arson, and so on. The so on is a huge opener. Um, or threatening such an act. Two, the intent to spread fear among the population, which would generally entail the creation of a public danger. 
but not always, uh, or directly or indirectly to coerce a national or international authority to take some action or refrain from taking some action. And third, it has to involve a transnational element, otherwise it's a purely domestic action. Reading the Lebanese law on terrorism together with the definition of terrorism that Judge Gassasi believes exists under customary international law, the appeals chamber concluded that the particular means used in an attack were not dispositive in determining whether an attack was terrorism or simply murder. In other words, contrary to what Lebanon has said in its statute and its courts have interpreted in the past, the appeals chamber opined that attacks committed by rifles or handguns, which are not likely to per se cause a danger to the general population, are nonetheless within the jurisdiction of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Now this is weird because the Special Tribunal for Lebanon is investigating a huge bombing. They did not even have to go into looking at whether attacks with rifles and handguns was included in terrorism. So there really was no reason for him to get to this place where you have to show that there's a difference between Lebanese law, international law, and to argue that international law governs. This is just Judge Cassese wanting to write about terrorism. Yet the significance of this aspect of the appeals chamber opinion is far broader than its application to the case. It's the first time ever in history that an international tribunal has authoritatively confirmed, I'll say that in quotation marks, the crystallization of a general definition of terrorism under international law. Now, what are the implications? I think the decision will almost certainly spark a debate about whether Judge Cassese's conclusion is correct in light of the conventional view that the international community has not yet reached consensus on a general definition of terrorism. But since this is a decision penned by an international tribunal, penned by one of the most distinguished jurists ever, and I think that it's even more significant that he just passed away, because that's going to have some consequence on how critical people are willing to be about it, I think that this could, in fact, become one of those things that scholars are now calling Groschen moments. Anybody ever heard of that term? Raise your hand. All right, my students have. Um, a Groschen moment is a term similar to what we call in the United States an international constitutional moment. It's when there's a paradigm shift, and by the virtue of one decision, suddenly international law changes in a radical way. Normally, international law is supposed to be created either by treaties or custom, which takes hundreds of years through the accretion of state practice and opinio juris. But once in a while, there is a legal opinion or a legal development that is so radical that the whole world embraces and it creates instant or near instant customary international law. An example of that would be the Nuremberg trial. Um, following World War II and the whole paradigm of individual criminal responsibility that it launched and all the other elements that came out of Nuremberg. Now, this could have a momentous effect on the three decades long effort of the international community to try to reach a consensus definition of terrorism. And it may play out in the General Assembly. I can, for example, see that at the next meeting, which will be coming up, where the committee looking at the definition of terrorism sits down and says, you know, we've been disagreeing about this for a long time, but Judge Cassese has just solved our problem. Let's, all in favor of, let's just going with his definition and seeing where that plays out. Now, notably, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon Appeals Chamber stated that the customary rule that defines terrorism also imposes a duty on states to prosecute those who commit acts of terrorism. This is as novel and radical as the definition itself, because normally we think of the extradite or prosecute requirement to only come from treaties that have that language. Now he's saying the customary international law also imposes that requirement. This would therefore mean that for all of those crimes that I listed as falling within the gaps of the anti-terrorism treaties, suddenly there is customary international law that requires prosecution, extradition, and cooperation for those crimes. Now, moreover, the UN Security Council in its resolution 1373 prohibited the financing of terrorism, but it didn't define the term or list the groups that were not allowed to be financed. The appeals chamber's general definition of terrorism therefore could potentially facilitate more effective implementation
of that important resolution. And I think in the end, when they say follow the money, that's very true when it comes to terrorism. It's not enough to get the foot soldiers, just like with piracy. I, I should, by the way, tell those of you who aren't at case that we have a distinguished jurist among us, um, Judge Rasmel Matuka, who is the chief judge of Kenya's, Kenya's piracy court. And just as the judge has told us that most of the pirates that are being prosecuted are foot soldiers and lower level people, and until they follow the money trail up higher, they're never going to make a real dent in piracy. It's the same with terrorism. If you want to combat terrorism, the best way to do it is not through predator drones. It's by cutting off their money supply. This Security Council resolution was intended to do that, but without a definition of terrorism, it has not been very successful. So perhaps Judge Cassese has solved that problem as well. Currently, U.S. courts will not award relief to victims of terrorism under the Alien Tort Claims Act because terrorism, they say, is not a defined crime in, under international law. This decision could change that. You could see, probably, I would predict, that there will be an entire cottage industry of terrorism cases launched in U.S. courts because of this decision. If you are interested in taking Alien Tort Claims Act, the time is ripe to be the first to file against any terrorist acts. Um, the ATCA, the Alien Tort Claims Act, says that if there is a non-U.S. citizen, an alien, who has been subject to a tort, and the tort is a violation of international law or a treaty of the United States, then the U.S. courts have jurisdiction to prosecute or to, to give civil relief. And the U.S. Supreme Court in Alvarez Machine says it only applies to the worst kinds of international crimes that are widely recognized, like torture in particular, and therefore the U.S. courts have not applied it to terrorism. Judge Cassese's opinion could change all that. And then finally, terrorist organizations that fall within this new definition may become legitimate targets of cross-border use of force if the host country is failing to suppress their attacks. In the old days, you weren't supposed to go into a country to blow up a terrorist training center or terrorist organization or terrorists themselves. After 9-11, that law has been changing. The international community has accepted, for example, uh, widely the use of the United States um, Special Forces to um, go down into Pakistan, which apparently was shielding uh, the leader of al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, from criminal responsibility, and to go and, and little, literally do a targeted killing of him. They went down and they did not try to apprehend him, they just took him out. All right, so all these things are like wonderful, possible uh, things that could happen because of this, but what's the critique? of this opinion. What are the downsides? The international community may not accept the validity of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon Appeals Chamber's opinion. One commentator has already called it, quote, a startling decision and has argued that every category or source relied upon by Judge Cassese's including national legislation, judicial decisions, regional and international treaties, and UN resolutions, was misinterpreted, exaggerated, or erroneously applied, end quote. This commentator adds that, quote, key sources that undermine the appeals chamber's findings or customary international law were hastily dismissed, trivialized, or ignored altogether by Judge Cassese. Let's go through some of these. First of all, the Security Council resolutions. The Special Tribunal Appeals Chamber cited Security Council Resolution 1566 of 2004 as evidence of a consensus definition of terrorism. That resolution has two elements. The first is, in fact, a definition that comes close to Judge Cassese. It says terrorism is something, one, when committed to provoke a state of terror or intimidate a population or compel a government or an international organization. But it said, number two, terrorism is where the conduct also constitutes an offense under the existing multinational anti-terrorism conventions. So in fact, the Security Council resolution did not expand or create a general definition of terrorism. It just reaffirmed that those things that were already illegal under the dozen specialized treaties were terrorist acts in general. Well, let's look at the other international treaties that Judge Cassese looks at. None of the two dozen anti-terrorism conventions contain a comprehensive definition of terrorism, nor do they even use the word terrorism, except for, I suppose, the Terrorist Financing Convention. 
The piecemeal approach was in fact adopted for the very reason that the international community could not agree on a definition of terrorism. There is something called the uh, draft convention on uh, terrorism, which I told you that the international community has been trying to adopt, but there has been this stalemate. And that convention, therefore, cannot be used as evidence of customary international law until such time as, first, it's concluded and adopted by the UN. That hasn't happened yet. Second, it enters into force, which is years off. And third, that there is widespread participation by states in it. None of those things have occurred. What about the regional conventions? The convention that they apply is the Convention of the Islamic Conference. Only one-fourth of the members of the Organization of the Islamic Conference are even parties to this Arab Convention on the Suppression of Terrorism. Not only that, but the convention defines terrorism only for the purposes of transnational cooperation. It does not require domestic prosecution, so it's completely out of context. Let's look at the national laws. The Special Tribunal for Lebanon cites 37 national laws that support the assertion that all the countries of the world have agreed on a definition of terrorism. Well, that's only 37 out of 192. But let's look at some of the laws that they examine. The tribunal doesn't differentiate between laws on purely domestic terrorism and those on transnational terrorism. Several of the laws only criminalize specific terrorism offenses defined in the treaties, like hijacking, hostage-taking, sabotage. They don't provide a general definition at all. Uh, several of them are not about criminal offenses, but are targeted at civil liability or activate emergency powers or authorize intelligence gathering or prompt immigration restrictions or enhanced criminal penalties for underlying ordinary offenses. They do not actually give a definition of terrorism. And many of the laws criminalize broader acts such as civil war or aggression or even violations of honor or even subverting the constitutional order. For example, Sri Lankan law, which is cited by Judge Kasese as evidence of a definition of terrorism accepted worldwide, classifies as terrorism, quote, defacing a road sign. The Bangladeshi law classified as terrorism, quote, to outrage the modesty of a woman or child. And the Bhutan law classifies as terrorism, quote, defaming the king. None of that indicates any kind of international consensus on this definition of terrorism. Then he looks at the national judicial decisions, but the appeals chamber invokes nine cases to support its contention that courts have explicitly recognized that there exists a crime of terrorism under customary international law, and most of these cases didn't even deal with the crime of terrorism. In the very first case that Judge Cassese cites, Suresh versus Canada, it's an immigration case. The appeals chamber not only overlooks and glosses over the fact that it's not a criminal case, but it also overlooks the Canadian Supreme Court's conclusion in that case that, quote, there is no single definition that is accepted internationally and, quote, one searches in vain for an authoritative definition. And finally, quote, the term is open to polit politicized manipulation, conjecture, and polemical interpretation. Wow, that's the case that Judge Cassese definitively thinks stands for this proposition? Well, he also ignores a number of other cases that disprove his thesis. For example, in 2003, a U.S. case called U.S. versus Yosef, this is, is a case involving whether there exists universal jurisdiction over terrorism under customary international law. There, the U.S. Court of Appeals stated, quote, we are regrettably no closer now than 18 years ago to an international consensus on the definition of terrorism or even its prosecution. So I think I have shown you that there is much to be concerned about in Judge Cassese's decision that clearly there's customary international law defining terrorism. But what then are the conclusions that we are to take from this? It could turn out that Judge Cassese's definition is a pariahic victory if states persistently object and fail to follow this definition of terrorism and the conclusion that the judge has that there is a duty to prosecute or extradite people that fall within this definition outside of the international treaties that define specific terrorist crimes. Secondly, aggressive application of new customary international law in a poorly reasoned decision can erode public confidence 
in this special tribunal for Lebanon and other international tribunals generally and in the United States in the whole concept of international law. There are, for example, states like Oklahoma that have recently enacted statutes that say their courts are not allowed to apply international law under any circumstances. That's interesting development and if it spreads, because courts are looking at things like this and saying, why should we apply international law when it's created by aggressive jurists who aren't grounding it in reality, that could be a real problem. And thirdly, inventing ex post facto liabilities infringe on human rights of criminal suspects. So there are many reasons to be concerned about this development. On the other hand, I predict that this decision is going to be widely cited. I think it will also be debated. But in the end, I do think it will be seen as a new milestone for international criminal law, and I'm guessing that it does unlock the logjam at the United Nations. We will see in the next 12 or so months. But in the meantime, this gentleman, Judge Antonio Cassese, may he rest in peace, continues to have an influence that will last well beyond his passing. And with that, I open it up for about 20 minutes of question and answers from the audience. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, I find this definition of terrorism profoundly disturbing. It seems that it calls terrorism any crime, including possibly minor crimes like mm -hmm. trespassing, with a political motivation, since whether or not any actual harm or fear occurs, the intent to coerce political action, national or international action, uh, I think this profoundly undermines or could be used to undermine civil liberties. I'd like you to comment on that. Yeah, well, one of the things that we've seen in the response of countries to 9-11, in part following the lead of the United States, is that countries have used the threat of terrorism and statutes that are anti-terrorists to actually cut down civil liberties in ways that have nothing to do with terrorism. They're, they're just using it as pretext. And this definition may further open the door for that. Um, in the definitions that have been debated at the UN, for example, they have asserted the word violent criminal acts. So at least that they are focusing on a more restrictive area that we more traditionally think of as terrorists. This could mean that just about anything that is criminal under statutes that might say, you know, defaming the king or the honor of a woman or whatever. Occupy Wall Street. Occupying could, could be not just criminal but terrorists, which has a stigma beyond mere criminal criminality. Um, they are arresting people for Occupy Wall Street. Uh, today I was listening on the way over in Atlanta and, and San Francisco and in other, countries, other cities. They are arresting people, but they're not charging them with terrorism. And in the U.S., if you are charged with terrorism, there are very high heightened uh, standards of um, sentencing that go along with that. And, and you're right to be concerned with this definition for those reasons. And I think any of us could spend hours picking apart, it might be fun to do actually, picking apart the problems with this definition. Um, Judge Cassese, in writing an opinion so quickly, obviously did not convene a group of experts to hash this out and think this through, and that's part of the problem with creating law in this fashion. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether it, it might be best to uh, to, to look for a, a definition of terrorism which which, which everybody uh, uh, agrees upon and and make like a, a narrow definition. I I like what what was said earlier about uh, using explosives against civilians is terrorism, but I mean what. Why not have uh, that? That is a narrow definition, and and just um, make ev everything else outside of the of the bounds of of the definition of terrorism. Yeah, you could say using explosives or any of the other things that are covered in these international treaties. As I said, there are large gaps. One of the ways that one court, the Indian Supreme Court has tried to deal with this problem is to say that terrorism is the peacetime equivalent of war crimes. 
And anything that you can't do under the Geneva Conventions, like attack civilians, uh, unless there is necessity and proportionality and that you've tried to distinguish them and you have a legitimate target, um, that would be an act of terrorism. The problem I see with the India approach is that terrorists are criminals. And already in our fight against terrorism, we've conflated them with military masterminds and even treated in some respects Osama bin Laden as if he was a world leader. Um, we focused so, so much on him and it was our war against him. It increased his stature, in fact. It, it gave him lots of worldwide support because we helped, not only did what he did in 9-11, help his cause, but the way we approached him, I think, also made him more powerful in the eyes of some. And so um, what I worry about is by equating terrorism with war crimes, you basically bring in all the laws of war. In fact, it would mean that if a terrorist attacks a government building or a military and there are collateral damage to civilians, that that is not a crime of terrorism, whereas under the current law, it would be. And so um, there, there's really problems all, with almost any approach that anybody's come up with, which shows how difficult and intractable it has been to try to come up with a definition of terrorism. Um, they are trying so hard at the UN to have these debates year after year. and They get closer and closer, but the world is so far apart on these issues. And so the question will be, what does a jurist's opinion like this which may not be well-founded and which may have all sorts of problems in its actual language due to the political dynamic at the UN and how will that play out? And, and I think that's where the, what will be interesting to see in the coming months or weeks. Uh, Professor Scharf, what is the authoritative reach, the actual authoritative reach of the tribunal that uh, the, uh, the judge uh, entered this uh, ruling in? Right. So, what has happened in the world is that the Security Council has created ad hoc international tribunals, first for the Yugoslavia Tribunal for the crisis in the former Yugoslavia, then the Rwanda Tribunal, only dealing with the crisis in Rwanda, um, the Special Court for Sierra Leone that looked at Sierra Leone but also Liberia because Charles Taylor had had involvement across border, and the Cambodia Tribunal. Each of those are freestanding ad hoc tribunals. Their precedent is not binding on anybody else. Uh, the judge's opinion is only binding on the trial court in his tribunal dealing with the crime of the 22 that died along with uh, the former prime minister of Lebanon. However, under international law, what international tribunals do can be persuasive authority. And they often are. I mean, in fact, the Yugoslavia Tribunal decisions that Judge Kasese penned are now cited by all tribunals, including the International Criminal Court and also by domestic courts. Uh, the idea of joint criminal enterprise liability is now being applied around the world in many countries that didn't have the felony murder rule. They don't like importing U.S. law, but they can import it indirectly through this new joint criminal enterprise liability. And so what you see is, although it does not have explicit authority beyond its own jurisdiction, it will have a powerful persuasive effect. And in international law, um, just like state practice, judicial decisions are often cited. And decisions cited by someone like Judge Kasese, and there's 300 pages, and I, I don't think most of the judges who look at this will critique it in the way that we have this morning, they often become powerful in their own right. And so um, it, I think, is going to have a sort of salience beyond what it is meant to have. Um, I was wondering, any definition seems to be vague in and of itself, and any consensus would be uh, almost um, unlikely. And who, how does the indictment process work? Is it, could a single country say, this group, this person is a terrorist, and internationally every uh, country, other country would have an automatic duty to um, prosecute them or extradite them? Or is there some sort of international consensus among many nations that would need to occur for a terrorist to internationally be defined as a terrorist? If somebody is indicted for a terrorist crime and they find themselves in the United States, the country where the person committed the crime can ask the United States to extradite the terrorists if we have an extradition treaty, and we have them with over 100 countries. The United States Extradition Court, which is a magistrate-level court, 
will look at not the actual case to see guilt or innocence, but rather one, is this actually an offense that we would recognize as a crime in the United States? There has to be a requirement of dual criminality. Or does the particular treaty list this offense? That's another way they approach it. And they won't look, I don't think, too carefully at the definition of the offense. They'll just say, it's terrorism. OK, we, we recognize that. Um, they might look at the definition. They might say, oh, this, they're calling it terrorism. But what it's really is, it's defamation. And we don't have criminal defamation in the United States, so we're not going to extradite. But I think if there was a violent act associated with it, we would extradite. The, the other two things the court looks at is, is the person really the, the perpetrator? So you just need to give a photograph. Um, and thirdly, is there an affidavit? And it, it can be hearsay evidence by the prosecutor explaining the underlying offense. And if you just read it, does that make sense? Is it Now, the US might not extradite if we think that um, the person will be subject to torture or persecuted rather than actually prosecuted. But short of that, we'll extradite. The question then is, if we don't extradite for any reason, will we prosecute? And our own laws may not cover all that is in this definition of terrorism. What that only means is if we can't prosecute, then we're going to be forced to extradite um, under the circumstances. And so I think you're right in, in the underlying question that a country can raise this kind of definition and get us to extradite somebody who, you know, even if we don't agree with this definition ourselves, because that's the nature of extradition between countries. Oh, and, and the other wrinkle is the Security Council has this resolution that says you're not allowed to finance terrorist groups. In the U.S., we've implemented that by listing a number of terrorist organizations. Once you get on that list, you, it is difficult to get off the list. And you're not presumed innocent for purposes of this list. You're presumed guilty. It's, it's very, uh, there are legal challenges to this. In fact, the European Court of Human Rights challenged this whole process. But in the U.S., it's so far been upheld. This definition of terrorism might broaden the types of groups that will fall within that list. And then there are people in the Treasury Department that are just making these lists every day. Would the definition of terrorism be used in conjunction with the uh, European arrest warrant? Because if you had a definition for, for terrorism, um, as I understand it, the Europeans do have an, um, they don't have a formal extradition process anymore. They have a as I said, the European arrest warrant. So once somebody was defined as a terrorist, they could be um, dealt with anywhere within Europe? Yeah, yeah, I think that is true. Also, you can, after someone falls within this definition, a country can then call up Interpol and give them the same kind of information I was just talking about. And Interpol will release a red notice, which is normally called an international arrest warrant which therefore means that any time the person comes to any country, when they put their passport through, because all countries now are sharing this information, there will be little siren and alarm bells and everything that go off, or maybe they do it silently. I don't know. I haven't seen it actually in effect. But whatever, people will arrest that person and say, look, there's an international arrest warrant for you issued by Interpol. But the underlying request could just be something that falls within this definition. More questions? Professor Scharf, I'm curious as your, your thoughts on if the U.S. would um, apply this definition of terrorism domestically. So for instance, in the, the situation of the, um, the attempted bombing of the plane in Detroit and the allegation that the Miranda rights were not given, that the um, alleged terrorist was, was not treated the way we normally would treat someone perpetrating a crime domestically and, you know, how with the issue of Guantanamo Bay and those things of, of how the U.S. treats terrorists versus a, a domestic criminal and, and how this definition may apply to that. Right. The U.S., you'll be surprised to hear, has 26 definitions of terrorism in U.S. domestic law that apply to all sorts of different things. So, for example, there's a definition of terrorism that applies only to, once you're convicted, enhancing the sentence. Um, and I could see this being used for that. Um, it's actually not that much different than the one we have. Uh, we have one that the State Department uses for um, trying to get information and report to Congress about terrorist acts. And I, I could see this being used for that. Uh, there's one for immigration purposes. People who are accused of terrorism cannot become citizens of the US. I could see this being adopted for that. It's not greatly different than the one we have. 
Interestingly, our federal law on terrorism has a general definition sort of like this, but it has a clause that says that it's not terrorism unless the U.S. Attorney General himself or herself certifies that it's an act of terrorism. And so what they've done is they've put a sort of political savings element to this, whereas many countries like Belgium and Germany and the European countries, if someone has, if there's a complaint, even by just a victim of terrorists, uh, that says, look, this person committed terrorism, this is the definition, the courts don't have the discretion to turn on or off that case based on what the political side of the government says. They have to go forward with it. So we have uh, some flexibility built into our system for that. Um, but yes, I can imagine that our Congress would see this definition of terrorism as broader than the ones that we currently use and say, hey, let's just start using this definition. It expands the reach of our Justice, Department of Justice authorities, and it may strengthen our hand against terrorism. So that may, in fact, that wasn't listed as some of the implications, but I wouldn't be surprised if our Congress and many parliaments around the world will seize upon this and start implementing it. And again, it will also go back to the question of civil liberties. I think this will have an effect on civil liberties. There's there, and then there, and then we're going to be out of time. So two last questions. Uh, yes, Professor Scharf. I was wondering what your thoughts are regarding uh, basically equating piracy with terrorism, um, as piracy is they're deemed as hostess humanis generis or enemies of mankind, uh, and also they're called uh, satellites of humanity, whether or not those two definitions can be sort of categorized uh, with this and basically put together to assist both in the treatment of pirates in the Horn of Africa and the Guinea Gulf uh, as well as with dealing with terrorists in an easier fashion by thinking of them in that manner. Yeah. Um, well, as I said, we have Judge Batuka here and many of the students have made pilgrimage to the judge's office in the second floor to chat with her. She's very open to that. So anytime, and also practitioners, if you pop by to law school, if you want to go and meet the judge, that's what she's here for. She's our distinguished jurist in residence. Uh, we've had many conversations, and including um, two weeks ago when we went to Washington, D.C., to attend the high Loving working group on piracy that um, I and the Public International Law and Policy Group have put together on this very question. And the consensus seems to be that many of the things that pirates do are synonymous with acts of terrorism. So if you take people hostage, that's a terrorist act. If you um, blow up a ship, that's covered by the terrorist uh, treaty on blowing up ships called the SUA Convention. Um, even if you finance piracy and what you're doing is financing hostage taking or kidnapping or blowing up ships, that seems like it's financing terrorism. The problem, and, and it's interesting that you raise this, is because you're doing a memo that looks at the terrorist treaties, the legislative history, and whether they require a political motive, because piracy has always been under international law for private ends. That's part of the definition of piracy. And the terrorism treaties are always about political ends, like this one, to try to get a government to do something or not to do something. But it's also got this general one, right, to spread fear among the population. And the pirates are doing that. Um, I don't know if that's their intention, because it kind of goes against what they're trying to accomplish, which is get a lot of money. Um, I will say that the, the ones who are spreading the fear are the insurance companies, because they realize by making piracy sound like a really major problem that they can increase insurance rates, especially during these for these rider clauses. And they're making a fortune. There's um, reportedly $24 billion losses this year to piracy, and more than two-thirds of that is because insurance rates have gone up. Um, maybe they're the terrorists. But I, I, I see the problem, and, and I'm interested to see how your memo comes out, because there is widespread interest in trying to conflate pirates and terrorists to use these vehicles that have been these treaties and mechanisms that have been created for uh, for terrorism against the pirates. And I suppose in your memo, you should take into account this definition as well. And the last question is there. The definition is really one of international terrorism. Right, right. Uh, uh, and, and we could have another definition of terrorism in, for example, our country or right. in our state. 
that doesn't require transnational elements. Right? Absolutely wouldn't require. Exactly. So when, if we're trying to get against the Oklahoma City bombing people, we're not going to require that somehow they, they popped up to Canada and back to get their um, you know, ingredients for the bomb. Um, so absolutely right. This is for the international definition of terrorism. And the key, again, is if it's an international one, then it requires cooperation between countries, including the prosecutor extradite requirement. Purely domestic acts of terrorism countries can do with and define as they will. And that's the last question. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out again this morning on behalf of Case Western Reserve and our dean and our international law program and our faculty. I hope you will come for the other sessions in coming weeks, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you.